Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am really pleased uh, to be here, and we have an excellent uh, panel uh, to discuss uh, private equity in the Middle East. Uh, private equity globally is uh, booming right now. I think uh, the amount of money uh, under management now uh, is reached uh, 1.43 trillion. Uh, a lot of money uh, to, to find deals, and uh, there's a record number of uh, funds of uh, funds fundraising. And uh, but what is happening now in the Middle East? That's what we want to hear. Uh, I've been reading, and I see you know uh, 2014 it was a very good year with again record fundraising even in the Middle East, uh, a lot of international participations. 2015, there's a lot of more questions, exits, fundraising, how we're doing, but you don't want to hear from me, you want to hear from uh, the expert we have here of various aspects. So uh, we have uh, Uda Alawati, uh, who is a partner and a chief investment officer at Abraj Group, which is based in Dubai and the Middle East, but by now is very global, going North Africa, Asia, everywhere. And uh, uh, she has an expert on the deal execution, uh, structuring, uh, portfolio management. So we will hear a lot from her on that uh, aspect. And I should also mention that he's a member of the Young Arab Leaders and uh, a mentor of the Sherry Blair Foundation for Women, which given discussion before, it's very good. Um, and then we have uh, Iqbal Khan, who is the CEO of Fajr Capital, which is a Islamic investment firm. And uh, he has the general, um, uh, we will talk about a general point of view of private equity in the Middle East and uh, what are the aspects, advantages and disadvantages. And then of course, uh, uh, the Middle East uh, is uh, famous uh, also for the fundraising. There's a lot of uh, money coming uh, from uh, uh, the Middle East and be invested in the Middle East, but also everywhere in the world. And therefore, we are very happy to have Zaid Zalatimo from uh, uh, Carlisle. He's the managing director uh, responsible for the relationship with investors in the Middle East and North Africa. And uh, he can tell us also more about uh, that in the world. But therefore, uh, uh, let, me, let me start with, uh, with the first question, uh, which is really, uh, if we look, I mean, uh, like the general question uh, looking at the Middle East and investment in the Middle East, uh, if we look at the ratio of private equity to GDP in the Middle East, uh, is much less uh, than uh, in uh, basically the rest of the world, most of the other countries. Uh, what is so special of, of the Middle East? Uh, why is this happening, you think? Yeah, so um, I th it's a good question. And uh, the generic answer to that is because it's a nascent industry and the sector is uh, underpenetrated. That is true. But we also have to remember that for a resource economies that are exporting uh, natural resources, there is a bit of skewing when you look at uh, the GDP isn't representative only of industrial or consumption economies. So that is also part of the reason uh, that it's there. But having said that, really private equity in the Middle East was not there. Uh, certainly when we started in uh, 2002 as the Abraj group, it was the uh, uh, the first firm that was focusing on the Middle East as a uh, private equity investment, and I, I was telling you in the break, we used to spend time in most meetings explaining to people what private equity means, what's LPGP structure. So it is a nascent asset class. The Islamic pri pri private equity business started much earlier, but had a false start when in the 70s, when Islamic finance started, Darul Mal Islamic Group, Al Baraka Group, these were all Musharaka private equity type of transactions. But what they found was that the governance framework and the asset management capabilities around people was not there. The legal framework was not there. So as they set up these private equity or Musharaka investment opportunities in billions of dollars, they had a very bad experience. So they shifted to the financing mode. And out of that experience, the Islamic banking industry grew. 
an Islamic private equity business lagged behind. But apart from what Huda said about the general uh, economy and the general status of the governance and the legal framework within the Islamic, within the Middle East was lacking. And as it has evolved, now you find more and more private equity transactions happening. And clearly, Abraj, led by Arif Naqvi, paved the way on which other institutions like ourselves have benefited and followed the way. So there is a lot of momentum going forward now. And I expect Islamic private equity to be a very big growth area in the future. If I can just, uh, my view on, on uh, private equity in the region, and one reason why perhaps the P, uh, private equity to GDP is lower in the Middle East and other regions is that you have a number of families, family groups, that uh, have surplus capital. And if you have family groups that have surplus capital, they don't need to sell their businesses. So that makes it difficult for a private equity firm to come into uh, an economy and buy businesses from families who don't need your capital. Okay, so, so this is setting up, this is private equity now, and now thinking about going into the future, what are the major trends you see and what impact are gonna have on the private equity in the area? Shall I start? Yes, with you again and then. So um, obviously we've seen a, uh, a very steep development curve. Uh, we've seen a lot of managers come. We've also seen a lot of managers go. I think in the hype of um, 2007, 2008, that was a peak in fundraising in Middle East. I think between the two years, you had some $9 billion raised, if not more. Um, and then there was a crash, uh, and you saw a lot of nascent names disappear. But some um, lasted through that downturn, uh, continued to do deals. And uh, we had uh, a lot more managers come in and do a lot of deals, including uh, uh, Fedger, which has really, uh, you know, accelerated its growth since uh, since inception. So we have had uh, we've had a lot of growth, and then we've had, on the other hand, uh, uh, people go through the cycles. So not just fundraising origination and execution, but also portfolio management and exits. And I think the fact that we have demonstrated the cycle. Has uh, has established this as uh, as an asset class much more um, as strongly, and therefore the outlook for it as uh, you know uh, from being something that is almost experimental or new is changed to something that is more uh, on the growth path, very uh, you know very uh, firmly. Um, there are the opportunity, uh, you know, His Excellency in the morning talked about the shoe example, uh, ex seller example. So I think that there is a lot of opportunity because of the nascent, uh, still the uh, low level of uh, penetration, the family businesses that have not yet uh, accessed it. So we see a lot. I mean, I'm sure you have more, you know, we have more detailed discussions around that, but I think the outlook is overall good but there is you know there's cyclicality in economies and we're going through some cycles and i think as institutional pe investors that that for us is a buying opportunity and uh, what about uh, the islamic private equity is the trend the same is it different sure so i think just coming back to the general trends yes. firstly governments are realizing that they have to be uh, referees and empires, not players, which means that the time for PFI in a very focused manner has come. And the current decline in oil prices and the budgetary pressures is leading towards more PFI types of investments. And therefore, we see huge opportunities in infrastructure. We have an infrastructure fund which is fully invested, and we are doing a second infrastructure fund. So we think that asset management in the real economy, from an Islamic perspective, linked to that will be another very big growth opportunity. The third trend which I think from a, a regional perspective is the current dislocation of political risk, oil prices, is creating a huge amount of turmoil and uncertainty, which is really leading to lots of opportunities. There are people who feel uncertain, therefore they want to sell their businesses. There are people who have built their businesses and now these businesses are at a stage where they want to realize value. So all in all, we think that the region will have a greater amount of private capital coming into it. 
and the region will be opening up because that is the only way to continue to grow the economies. No, so if in, I, I'm going to ask you a, a different trend, which is in fundraising. How, how, has it, how do you see that evolving in the area? Uh, I, I've, I've seen that, that some people say with a lower, price, uh, lower oil prices, there have been less investment uh, coming from the area. Is that true? And anyway, how much goes into the area or internationally? Uh, how do you see going forward? You know, there's a lot of uh, media reports about uh, sovereign wealth funds uh, sort of pulling back and liquidating international investments. I have to tell you, I haven't seen it. Um, you know, we're doing really well. Uh, you know, by and large, the sovereign funds and the pension plans throughout the region, not only in the GCC, but throughout the broader MENA region, are underallocated to private equity. And, you know, I can see people uh, liquidating from fixed income portfolios, particularly as interest rates are going to go up, not down. You probably should maybe not be in fixed income portfolios, but you know if you have private equity uh, funds that are delivering you know two extra returns within four years, my thinking is you probably want to increase allocations to them, not decrease. And in in general, maybe I can ask uh, all of you. I mean, is it also the fundraising for the area? How is it evolving? Is it more going out? Or do you have to compete with the uh, Zaid, or is it? Uh... <laughs> We always have to compete for capital. <laughs> um, look, I think there there uh, there is a an increase. Uh, so, from a fundraising perspective, the turmoil that we're all talking about is obviously relevant because people read headlines and they look at the risk. So, from a asset class, private equity having gone through the cycle is become more established. But from the so two sets of investors, the regional investors and then the foreign investors investing into the region. Um, we've seen a lot, of, we, we've increased fundraising from the international investor base actually across uh, Middle East and Africa. We raised about one and a half billion dollars we closed this year. So we have had success in doing that. But what we see is increased focus on what parts of the region you're focusing on because really it's not right to uh, paint the the entire region with a broad brush the local knowledge the po knowledge of pockets of opportunity and at the end of the day the specific company and the micro opportunity the counterparty risk that's what it drives returns at the end of the day so investors are the institutional investors are very focused on that we do see some retrenching from certain investors who are on the uh, on the fence anyway about it. I think for them it has been more difficult. But the most difficult uh, uh, argument historically for global growth markets in general has been valuation and overcrowded by, uh, and by private equity. So interestingly now with uh, the sort of turmoil, the, you know, some people trying to realize value, uh, more business coming to the market, people feel a little bit more optimistic about the valuation aspect of things. On top of that, from a GCC perspective, uh, there is the oil um, market impact, which makes people ask questions around, well, what's going to happen to the economies and the, uh, how prolonged will the downturn be? But the reality is that that is dri drive putting uh, the government's uh, focus onto private sector reform, uh, uh, investment laws, and that in turn creates an opportunity. Plus, it is uh, it means that um, you're you, you're investing. You know, because of the, some of the things that IMF has said, for example, about the sustainability of the pegs as, as well. The currency risk in the GCC context in itself is one that is from a you know from the global growth markets, which are growing at higher than the developed market rate, one of the safe havens. So that uh, that helps with the um, turmoil, but you have to be very careful about. Well, we're not today, for example, investing in Syria, uh, and you know that's not something foreseeable. And you know people need to understand what are what are the implications of those markets and how we are addressing them. Hey, well, do you want to? Sure. Uh, I, I think that if you are in a Braj or a Carlisle or a KKR or Blackstone, and you have your track record backing you up, fundraising, in fact, is not at all difficult. What's happening now in fundraising, <laughs> what's happening in fundraising, no, because if you have a track record, it people, it helps. But what is happening is now that the countries are realizing 
that instead of being players, they want to create funds in their own markets and they want private equity firm, firms to come and do theme funds focused on the country. So you raise money from the country and neighboring countries and affinity investors and you invest into the country. What I call the Ashmore model and they have done it very successfully. I see an increase in that. Second theme fund, like we have our infrastructure fund, the response from international investors and regional investors that they have an appetite for this asset class. But the biggest amount of fundraising is on a deal by deal, transaction by transaction basis, where people feel that they are investing into a company, into a governance structure, into a management team, and therefore they feel much more comfortable. So all those form, different forms of fundraising are continuing. But one area which is going to ha is increasingly becoming important is this, that the Islamic finance industry with a large pool of surplus liquidity will increasingly allocate capital, both through the family offices, but I believe also from the sovereigns to Sharia compliant private equity fund. And therefore asset management in the real economy from an Islamic finance perspective will be the biggest growth area in the next 10 years. Given that you touched on the family offices, there's one question I want to ask, given that we have here both the investment sides, the fundraising sides. Uh, is there a strange situation, given that there are all these uh, very large family offices or family firms, they are both on the, could be on the receiving side as investment, but they're also fundraising. Is there any conflict, any complexity that this uh, creates? To make sure I understand, complexity brought on by family offices, perhaps competing with deals? Exactly, competing with deals, but also, you know, receiving the investment and um, also investing. First, I feel I'm obliged to say that um, talented fundraisers help uh, fundraising, in, in addition to track record. But, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> just saying. Um, you know, what I'm finding in the family office market, and I would say family offices probably represent 15% of our AUMs, and we largely deal with family offices that have maybe an international presence and have, have had corporate governance in place for many, many years. But what I'm seeing is um, a, a, a growth in uh, people heading towards a corporate governance structure uh, that is, you know, sort of world class. And, um, and, and that's, that's a, I think that'll be a challenge for some private equity firms. Um, it's an opportunity also. It means that you need to service a more sophisticated investor. And, you know, you may be competing with them also on deals. Absolutely. So, uh, at Fajr, we have 40% of our, 42% to be precise, money from the family offices. And as was rightly pointed out, that what you need is independent directors and especially the investment committee, the audit committee, and those committees to be chaired by independent directors and have a very clear-cut conflict resolution policies, which we do have. And if you have that, then this is not an issue. In fact, it helps because when you have family offices who have businesses and who are on the ground, they can give you intelligence, which you would normally not get in your due diligence process. But it's also your, when you do the due diligence and so on, is that also your uh, experience? Is it something that facilitates your uh, job? Absolutely. Look, I think the, the, uh, in any business, in any market, being on the ground, having that access through your networks, through your um, uh, shareholders, through your investors is essential. Uh, we very much believe in on-ground presence. Uh, we have 25 uh, offices, 25 offices across the globe, exactly for that reason, because it's difficult. You can get the paperwork and the data, uh, but really to understand the dynamics of um, of the uh, industry as well as the uh, the company, investi company, it is important to rely on relationships as. If you think about it, a lot of the private equity we do tends to be partnerships. Unlike the sort of Western model where it's you know leveraged buyouts or where it's uh, there's generally no mix between owner and manager, a lot of the opportunities in our part of the world tend to end up in uh, partnerships between the PE and the promoter family. 
uh, which means that you need to be sure of the not just the business and the industry it operates in, but also your counterparty. How are they to work with? How have they worked with other people? How have they been in partnership situations? So absolutely on the ground intelligence is one of the key areas of diligence. So in general, I guess uh, when the, there's always this discussion, do you want to have an international or you want to have a local office? Uh, would you say in the Middle East that is uh, something particularly important more than in other, for example, growth economies? Or uh... We found it to be important in growth economies in general. So, you know, whether it's in the Middle East, North Africa, Latin America, it is important to have the on-the-ground presence. Um, it, also, I think one notable thing about some of these markets is that they can be on their own uh, small. I mean, take in the Middle East, Saudi, UAE, Egypt are big markets, but then you have other countries that on their own small, uh, uh, represent smaller markets, but you can create regional champions, opportunities, and value is derived by aggregating, taking country-specific um, opportunities, making them pan-regional. To do that, you really have to understand the dynamics. And because there's such, uh, they can be small pockets, the rules and regulations vary, the local dynamics vary, and you, you have to be able to navigate that effectively. And, and fundraising, how important it is to be constantly present and uh, have a constant presence? Uh, it, it is important um, to be present. It is, I think, maybe more important to be responsive and transparent. And um, uh, I will tell you the institutional investor base in the Middle East, and I'm referring mostly to the sovereign wealth funds, are as sophisticated as any investor anywhere in the world. And in fact, a lot of the people who run the sovereign wealth funds in the Middle East uh, came from major institutions abroad. So they brought best practices with them, and they, they expect a level of diligence that is uncompromising. And so presence is important, but you really have to be on the ball and, and very responsive because it is a very competitive landscape. And if you, you know, if you're, if you're not on the ball, you're, you're just not gonna, you're not gonna succeed. Well, let me, I want to come back to something uh, you mentioned uh, before and uh, explore a bit more. You were talking about uh, private capital, government spending, uh, private capital entering. Now, uh, this possibility of private capital partnering with, uh, with the government, what do you think is the impact? I mean, how does it, is it that going to evolve? What are the effects of that going looking forward? I think uh, historically when the Middle Eastern countries became independent, we by and large chose a larger role for the government because we wanted to create an enabling infrastructure, which I believe was the right thing for that time. But now increasingly there is a realization that the government have to be referees and empires. And if they have to play, they have to play with the private sector, not against the private sector. So I believe that the governments will embrace PFI as an initiative, so we'll find more public-private partnership. I believe the governments will create funds in which they will invest and invite other investors, affinity investors, partner investors to invest into those funds and have them managed by world-class private equity operators in themed funds. For example, they want to develop SME, they can come to a branch and say, you've got an experience in so many countries. Here is a pot of money, implement your SME strategy in my country. So I see this kind of an SME, venture capital, infrastructure, funds increasingly taking place across the Islamic world and across the Middle East. The decline in oil prices is really something which has opened up people's mind and I think social media is putting huge pressure. And there is a realization that the younger population in the Middle East, which will be coming to get jobs, have to be turned around to be not just job seekers, but job creators. And you can only do that if you have a concerted strategy. So policy change, proactive allocation of funds to a whole range of asset classes, including infrastructure, SMEs, private equity, venture capital, but part of the deal would be that invest into our country. And that, when it's done by the private sector, will be a better return on the investment by the governments 
because we have seen many mega big projects run by the government, owned by the government, later on being restructured. And there are very few good examples of success in this area. So the governments are changing their position in this regard. Do you want to add or add? Maybe just an example to illustrate that. I was recently contacted by a uh, one of the world-class consultants on a, uh, on a mandate by government, uh, Ministry of Labor plus Ministry of Finance jointly, uh, which wanted to understand how can we increase private sector participation in the economy. This is an oil-rich economy, and they wanted to um, really understand the problems. And the level of questioning, I have been part, I've, uh, participated in this sort of um, exercise in the past, and what I realized from the level of questioning is that they have begun to understand the issues very well, they are uh, with the pressure of the oil prices and realizing that you know that there is a limit to how much they can do. Uh, there is a real commitment to make this happen, and uh, and most importantly, there is engagement even at the level of strategy directly with the private sector to get the feedback. Uh, there's a lot to be seen uh, in the execution. Uh, but we can, uh, you know, I, I think that there is a real commitment there. And um, if we want to expand the private sector in a way, then very important is market liberalization, right? That is very important. And uh, this is going on right now, I think, uh, in the you know, Middle East, including the opening of the Saudi stock market to foreign investors. Do you see more of that happening, more of a pressure? coming from private equity or coming from the government to liberalize, to leave the space to the private capital? So the governments, as I said earlier, have realized that the old approach will not work. And time is ticking. And there is a huge amount of pressure on the leadership to bring about a transformation of the economies. So the governments are embarked on this journey to change the rules, regulations, and create an enabling framework. Just to give you an example, in Saudi Arabia, the foreign, only recently they have started codifying and collecting the judgments of the various judges across the kingdom. And this database is now made available to judges across Saudi Arabia. So when they, can, when they, take, when they look at a case, they can decide on case precedent. And that is leading to faster decision making in the courts. That is leading to a greater realization that there is a respect for the rule of law, which was always there, but if it was not codified, they could not do it. So there is a whole change of policy measures, which is being driven by the urgency of the situation as we talked before. Well, that is... Uh, uh Thank you very much. I'm, I'm just being told that we, we are running a bit out of time, so we, there's no time, unfortunately, for a Q&A. Uh, maybe I just want one, one uh, last uh, question about how sophisticated are the investors when they choose to private equity investing abroad? Uh, you know, how do they think about structuring their portfolio? And then uh, we... we if, as I said earlier, the sovereign funds uh, who uh, I have some statistics I'll bore you with. Uh, the only documented uh, number for any sovereign fund is the KIA, and the KIA has $32 billion uh, in private equity. So if you extrapolate from KIA to the other sovereign funds, I think the number is probably around $150 billion in private equity investments from sovereign funds in the region. Um, I think the total region, uh, fund commitments from the region, uh, institutional plus private clients, I think the number is probably around 200 to 250 billion dollars. What I'll say is, yes, the sovereigns are very sophisticated. Um, you know, they play at international standards. The pension, uh, the pension fund market is on the institutional side the highest growth areas, because. Pension plans, not only in the GCC, but across the Middle East, used to be used to support local stock markets and real estate investments. Now they're diversifying into you know, all other asset classes, and they, they will eventually reach the sort of 10% target of private equity uh, that most pension plans have. On the family office side, 
we are seeing a growing number of family offices, as I said earlier, moving into having proper corporate governance, having you know, empowered people at the helm who can uh, make decisions and report to a, a family board as opposed to uh, having a family member uh, make sort of tactical investment decisions, which I think was the old model. Thank you very much. I, I, I want to, str I mean, it's always interesting to talking to people, you know, on the ground and live there because I think the, the, the perspective I'm getting from this uh, panel is actually much more optimistic. It is like declining of prices turmoil as actually more as, a, as an opportunity. So I'm uh, glad we finish on uh, this uh, positive note and, uh, and uh, sophisticated investors. But uh, please join me in uh, thanking uh, the panelists for a very informative session. <laughs>